Hey everybody, this is Chris. And this is Julia, and this is episode number 40 of the Mixology Talk podcast. This podcast has just turned as old as I did. You just t- turned as old as the podcast. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look at high-end cocktail bars nowadays, you can see a wide variety of fancy, expensive cocktail ingredients. And some of these brands take themselves really, really seriously. But one of my favorite things about the world of cocktails is how everything, including cocktails, techniques, and ingredients alike, all have their own history. It's something I've mentioned quite a few times. And some of those stories are actually really fascinating. So this week, we're going to try something new. We're going to talk about two cocktail ingredients and their history, where they came from, who invented them, and how they made it to where they are today. So when you start looking at the history of various spirits, there's usually two common threads. Either... Someone wanted moonshine because they wanted to get drunk or stay warm or whatever. And they basically found any way possible to get some. That's very true, yeah. (laughs) Or someone thought that infusing alcohol with herbs, spices, botanicals, dirt, whatever they could find, would give it some sort of medicinal qualities. And often it's a combination of both of those things. (laughs) Yeah, I think it probably is. Well, today we're going to be talking more about the medicinal ones. And so the first ingredient that I wanted to mention was definitely uh, originated as a medicinal elixir, if you want to call it that. And this ingredient, it was best known now for its role in the rusty nail cocktail. So uh, do you know what I'm talking about? I have an idea. You have an idea. (laughs) We're going to talk about Drambuie. Yeah, and I know that Drambuie has a really kind of sordid past, so this should be really interesting. Don't we all? (laughs) So, Drambuie was originally created, apparently, by Prince Charles Edward Stewart, also known as Bonnie Prince Charlie. Wee Bonnie Prince Charlie. I feel bad for uh, for poor wee Bonnie Prince. That was the worst accent I've ever had. Was that an accent? I tried. I really tried. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. We'll give you your money back at the end of the episode. (laughs) Free 90 free, coming at you. (laughs) In July 1746... Bonnie Prince Charlie was on the run after a failed attempt to take over the throne and restore his family, the Stuarts, to the throne in Great Britain. Somewhere along the way, he created this particular liqueur and claimed it had medicinal properties. And if you look into it, you can find a couple anecdotal stories about people who were sick, and then they had some, and then they felt better, and it's all very scientific. Not really. Yeah, I usually feel better after a couple of drinks. Don't we all? Exactly. (laughs) So um, at the time, it was considered a medicinal elixir, but I think I have my doubts. (laughs) So during his escape, Bonnie Prince Charlie was escaping across the highlands of Scotland and was actually assisted by several of the clans in the area, including the clan McKinnon. In gratitude, Prince Charlie shared his recipe for what he called his personal liqueur with the clan McKinnon, and it stayed in that family for generations. It actually wasn't until more than 100 years later that it was eventually served to the public. A guy by the name of John Ross of the Broadford Hotel started making it and serving it to guests somewhere around 1870. The customers seemed to like it and described it as a drink that satisfies. But of course, they weren't speaking English at the time. They were speaking Gaelic. And I'm now going to attempt to speak Gaelic. Oh, this should be fun. This is going to be terrible. (laughs) In Gaelic, a drink that satisfies is Andram Budik, which eventually became shortened to Drambui. So the name stuck, and by the name I mean Drambui, not the other one I'm not going to try to say again, and the company grew. It became a real company, and eventually it was the first liqueur introduced to the House of Lords in 1916. The following year, it found its way into Buckingham Palace's cellar, and after the First World War, the company began to expand its exports beyond the borders of Great Britain and internationally into other countries. So like most spirits, of course, Drambuie lost quite a bit of business in the U.S. when Prohibition stuck. But what's something that's really interesting about Drambuie is I think it ended up benefiting from Prohibition. And that's because over the course of the Prohibition, it became known as an ingredient that paired well with the awful hooch that was being smuggled into speakeasies. And so as it happened, it became fairly, I don't want to say well distributed, but it was it was being smuggled right alongside all of this hooch because it made the awful stuff palatable. 
Yeah, cover up the bad stuff with the good stuff. Exactly. <laughs> so this is apparently the origin of the drink that we now know is the rusty nail. Was basically just Drambuie trying to cover up the awful taste of the smuggled liquor. You know what's amazing is I wonder how many personal liqueurs or, you know, even alcohols have been kind of disappeared into antiquity over the years. It makes you wonder because, you know, back in the day we didn't have cocktail books. We didn't have these standard recipes. People just had whatever hooch they could make in their backyard and whatever plants they could grow in their backyard. Yeah, and exactly. There's got to be some incredible recipes that have disappeared over time. However, it's all the more reason for us to make some of our own. That's true. And share it. Cause, <laughs> and share it. Yeah, the exactly. The more people know about it, the less likely it's going to disappear. We're going to have to make the Tunstall family liqueur. Oh, God. Well, I don't even want to know what's going to be in that. It's probably just going to be chartreuse, let's be yeah, honest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> infuse chartreuse. What do you infuse your chartreuse with? More chartreuse. More chartreuse. <laughs> exactly. Which brings me to my favorite uh, liquor story of all time. And I've already kind of given it away. Totally given it away. We're going to be talking about... Chartreuse. We had to talk about chartreuse, though, because it's got one of the most incredible stories of any liqueur. I feel like you could make an action movie about it. You probably could. and I, Lots of tense music. Yeah. And monks running around. Absolutely. Ooh, we can bring back the monk chant. Remember that when it I became like popular? I like it. Yeah. Like, about the year you were born? <laughs> <laughs> I totally remember that. <laughs> So what's the order of chartreuse? The story of chartreuse actually goes all the way back to 1605. That's uh, about 150 years before my story. Uh, actually, it started a li um, quite a few years earlier because in 1605, when a story of chartreuse starts, the order of chartreuse, the monks who make it, was already about 500 years old by that time. Now you're just trying to one-up me. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, but in 1605, and I'm going to butcher this gentleman's name, and I apologize for... Sorry, for Francois. This, yeah. So Francois Hannibal de Estris um, gave the Chartreuse Monastery in Vauvert a strange gift. It was a manuscript for an elixir that was probably created by an extremely skilled alchemist sometime in the prior century. Now, the story that I heard um, was that in Paris, there was two different areas um, one area known as the Devil's Road and the other area known as the Angel's Road. And the Devil's Road is where all the alchemists lived and they practiced turning lead to gold. And we all know those stories. But on the other end was where all the clergy lived and all the monasteries and all the churches were. And so this alchemist discovered this, uh, what they called the elixir of long life back then, but knew that he could never produce it and it would never gain acceptance. So he actually found a way to take it from the Devil's Road to the Angel's Road to give it the benefit that it deserved. So that was kind of the original story of how it came to be in the hands of the Chartreusian monks. Um, by this time, the Elixir of Long Life, as it was known then, um, began to be produced by the Chartreusian monks and being sold in very small quantities in nearby villages. This was the elixir and what is now called the Elixir Vegetal de Grand Chartreuse. Which is different from the chartreuse you normally see in cocktail recipes, right? Absolutely. So the Elixir uh, Vegetal is much higher in proof. It's about 69%, where the green chartreuse is definitely a lot tamer, and that runs in about 55%. Okay. But the uh, original Elixir Vegetal was considered medicinal, and a couple of people kind of figured out that it actually tasted pretty good. So in 1764 is when they dropped the proof down and released green chartreuse. I get it. Okay. So yeah, that was the beginning of the now famous green chartreuse. So speaking of famous, this is a new ingredient that's gained popularity quickly, and it was just growing in distribution around France when the French Revolution broke out in 1789. If this was an action movie, I think there would be tense music right now. I think so. Somebody's on horseback running away. Yep. Yeah. Everybody imagine tense music. Yeah, exactly. With monks chanting in the background. Definitely. I can see it like, playing out right There's now. There's galloping horses. Absolutely Who's galloping our star? horses. Gerard Depardieu in his prime, maybe? I don't know. I don't know any <laughs> actors. So, members of all religious orders were forced to leave the country and the Chartreusian monks left just four years later. They made a copy of the original manuscript but also pocketed the original. The original manuscript narrowly escaped capture when the monk who was carrying it was in prison. The original manuscript was passed down through many people being sold, passed down, rejected by the government and eventually turned uh, returned to the Chartreuse monks uh, after they returned to the distillery in 1816. At one point in history, um, which um, is one of my favorite points of this whole thing of the manuscript, at one point in history, the French government mandated that anything that was produced in France, all the recipes had to be shipped to the government 
Um, so the Chartreuse monks ship their manuscript to the government and they send it back as rejected because they didn't think it was unique enough. So at one point, the, chart- uh, the French government actually had the recipe for, uh, for green chartreuse, but well, sent if it it's, back. Well, if, if it's not unique, then it sounds like the French government still has another very similar recipe. But they could. You and should I give them a ring. Yeah, exactly. And I know that m- over the years, many people have r- tried to reproduce uh, chartreuse and have failed miserably. One of those things that adds a whole other layer to the story of chartreuse. So learning from the past, once again, the chartreuse distilleries uh, distillery developed an even sweeter, lower proof liqueur in 1838. And this one is what we now call yellow chartreuse. They're just not very creative about their product names, are they? No, not really. Although the color chartreuse was actually named after the color of the original liqueur. I bet you didn't know that one. I did not know that. <laughs> but yeah, the story isn't over. And I warned you that chartreuse has this really kind of crazy history. So back in 1903, the French government nationalized the distillery and kicked out the monks yet again. Man, they just can't get a break. Seriously. And uh, they actually landed in Spain, uh, from what I remember. And in 1929, the distillery uh, that now owned the chartreuse trademark went bankrupt. And the shares were bought by the friends of the monks who gave them ownership again and the trademark back to the Chartreusian monks. So production would uh, resume until 1935 when the distillery was almost completely destroyed in a landslide, forcing the monks to relocate yet again. So the manufacturing was then moved to Voron, where it continues up to this day. You were not kidding. That is a crazy story. Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating history, and um, if you take a look at some really old antique bottles of Chartreuse, which definitely floats around there, um, there's some that are actually were from the original distillery way back in the early 1900s and 18, uh, late 1800s. So it's That's just That's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating history and a fascinating liqueur. So if you did own a super old bottle of chartreuse, Chris, do you have any suggestions on how somebody could find out how old it is? You know, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, but seriously, we uh, or I wrote an article a couple of months ago kind of describing how to get a general idea of when the bottle of chartreuse was actually produced. So if you head on over to mixologytalk.com slash 40, we'll, uh, we'll provide a link to that uh, article in there. So there you have it. Two amazing histories of two great cocktail ingredients that we use all the time today. So did you like this style of episode? There are literally hundreds of other spirits and liqueurs that have their own incredible stories. If you'd like to hear more uh, of these, please let us know. You can head over to mixologytalk.com slash 40 and let us know in the comments. We'll also include an overview of the history of Drambuie and Chartreuse in those show notes and a link to the post that Chris mentioned about finding the date of your antique bottle of Chartreuse that I hope you have because that's awesome. If you're enjoying this podcast, it would really mean a lot to us if you take one moment and leave us a review in iTunes. It actually helps us reach more people because if we get more reviews, iTunes actually shows our podcast to more people. So it would really help us out. Yeah, we definitely appreciate it. So thank you very much, everyone, and we'll catch everyone next week. Cheers. Cheers. Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.